Good evening. It is a uh, great blessing to be here again. There we go. It's a great blessing to be here again. We are the uh, Michelin family. Uh, myself, Jonathan, and my wife, Annika, is here, and my uh, son, Jason. You want to wave there, Jason? All right. Yeah. yeah all right. And uh, he just turned four, but uh, uh, it, it is a uh, blessing for us to be here again. We're missionaries there to Metro Manila in the Philippines. And so I'll share a, a few quick things about that before we show the video. And yes, we did drive down today from the land of Michigan. And it's a, uh, we're, we're happy to experience freedom here in Ohio uh, after being knocked up with uh, Governor uh, uh, Whitmore up there. But the Philipp Manila uh, is now, okay, the world's most densely populated city. It's not the world's largest city uh, geographically by any means. Uh, it's not the world's most populated city either. I think that might be Tokyo or Mexico City. But Manila has become the world's most crowded city. All right? You, in, in Metro Manila, you have 25 million people now, all just in that one uh, city area. That's all just in 240 square miles. Okay? So to help us picture that, I mean, if you were to take all the folks in the great state of Ohio uh, and then double that to Ohio's and then add a couple more million on top of that, and you were to squeeze all those people in one city, uh, that's what you'd be looking at in Metro Manila. All right? So social distancing is out the door on that. Uh, in fact, Manila, you'll see in the video, but Manila proper has 108,000 people now per square mile. All right, so that's how packed in they are. But if you're a fisherman, if you're a fisher of men, you want to grow all the fish in one hole, amen, in one fishing hole. And that's what it is there in Manila. Now, I was sharing with the one brother, the Philippines is made up of 7,000 islands, and I know you support a couple good brothers there uh, in Cebu and in other places. 7,000 islands, but 25% of the population of the whole country lives right there in Manila. So imagine having a city uh, in the United States, they held a quarter of all our people. Boy, we'd be wanting to reach that with the gospel. And that's what Manila is like. That's what God has called us. Now, I'm a second-generation missionary, uh, which means that I grew up there in the field uh, in the Philippines. My father was a U.S. Marine. He got saved in the Marines. Uh, and uh, ran, he, he went away from home because he didn't like his dad's rules, so he joined the Marines. But uh, he found out that wasn't a good recipe. That wasn't a very successful uh, recipe. You know, you, you get more rules. But anyway, I guess that broke up, and he got saved. Uh, but then he became a missionary. So from the age of seven onward, I was raised there on the field, not in Manila, but learning the language. And so uh, I already, by God's grace, uh, speak fluently uh, the language and preaching the language. It's a much longer language. Uh, for instance, John 3, 16 is Garo na lang ang pag-ibig ng Diyos na binigay niya ang kanyang nag-iisang buktong na anak na sino man ang sumampalataya sa kanya hindi pa papahamak pero makakamdan ng buhay na walang hanggan. Or I tried to do all that in one breath, but I, I just couldn't. Anyway, services go along, okay? Because the preaching goes along, because the language is long, but not tonight, amen? Tonight is in English, so don't, don't worry about that. Uh, my wife also speaks to God, and of course she's from the Philippines. Her dad also is a preacher. Got saved and then started a church right there in the Philippines. So both sides have trained and equipped us uh, for the Lord's work, and we want to make a good return uh, on the investment uh, that the generation before has, has already placed in us. Uh, so we've been on deputation now, I think, for 18 months or so, and uh, we were plan hoping to already be on the field. In fact, we, we had spoken with those speakers uh, this months ago, uh, but then that was those are plans uh, BC, amen, uh, before Corona, uh, and that, that, that Corona has shifted uh, everybody's plans. Uh, but uh, we're blessed to be able to be here now. And, and as soon as the Philippines opens back up, we're looking forward to heading over there. Uh, right now, the, the borders are closed to uh, any uh, international flights for non-citizens. Uh, they're not letting them in. But we're praying uh, soon, and uh, this month or, or next month, we'll, we'll watch it. And we can start making plans to. And over there. But last, I just want to mention the Philippines is one of those fields uh, we hear a lot about because there is a openness, a rightness right now uh, for the gospel there. Boy, it is harvest time. Amen. It is harvest time there. Um, I heard hear stories of, of how it uh, was in, in uh, years gone by in the United States, you know, and, and just the uh, rightness of souls, and we still pray to that end. But uh, I tell you, it is that way right now in the Philippines. It's harvest time. It's a race against time. And largely, it's that way because of the blood that was shed there by U.S. soldiers during World War II. 
to help liberate Filipino people from Japanese occupation. This has opened up the heart of the Filipino to receive the gospel, to listen to the gospel that comes from missionaries and preachers from America. Because we tell them, hey, we came uh, the first time to free you uh, uh, during the war, and now we come with the, the free gospel message. Amen. And that's what it's all about. That's what the 4th of July and the, the freedom that we have in Christ is all about. And as one of the brothers mentioned, they all still know. Little kids know who General Douglas MacArthur is. Amen. Uh, I didn't say John MacArthur, okay? Uh, no, no, not John MacArthur, but Douglas MacArthur. He said, I shall return. And uh, they all the little kids know who that is. And so it makes it easy there to preach, you know, you know, getting saved and, and the rapture. You know, Jesus also said, I shall return, and, and you need to be ready. And so they're, they're thankful for what we did during World War II. And so this creates a, a openness in the heart of the Filipino people. Still much work to be done. You'll see uh, Manila is 86% Roman Catholic still. The Philippines as a whole is 80% Roman Catholic. 5% is still uh, Muslim down in those southern islands. Uh, fighting always going on down there. And then another 5% of the Philippines is a cult. That's a huge cult uh, called the Iglesia de Cristo, which is a Filipino cult that denies the deity of Christ. It's similar to Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. It's their own cult. And so much work to be done. But uh, I pray that this video will just for a few minutes, just five minutes or so, will help take us to Manila uh, just for a few moments tonight. And I pray it will be a blessing to you. Teenage boy on the mission field. 
We know the only thing that will save them is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith in his death on the cross as the only sinless Son of God, once and for all, to atone for sin. God has called us to preach the gospel here in Metro Manila. As a boy, I grew up on this mission field and saw firsthand the need and learned the ministry under the faithful service of my parents, better missionaries Mike and the Lord Mr. I was saved at the age of seven while our family was on the deputation trail. Thanks to my upbringing, I speak fluent Tagalog and have been teaching and preaching in the local language since a teenager. Because of this, we will not need to spend any precious time in language school or cultural okay. adjustment, yeah, but, yeah, but we go straight to the, the Word of God. Returning to the United States, I attended and graduated from Heartland Baptist Bible College under Pastor Sam Davison in 2011. My wife Annika also grew up in the Philippines at a pastor's home and was raised to serve in the ministry. She also graduated Bible College from West Coast Baptist College under Pastor Paul Chapel. 2011. We were married in 2015, and for the past three years, we have been laboring and reaching the large Filipino population in San Diego, California, through the Mira Mesa Bible Baptist Church under Pastor Willie Dell, which also served as my ordained church as a preacher into the gospel ministry. We are now being sent out of my own church, Southside Baptist Tabernacle in Ypsilanti, Michigan, under Pastor Chris Watts as missionaries to Metro Manila. In God's moving, the Philippines has also become a strategic launching point for missions and Filipinos to reach further into the 1040 window. The 1040 window is the most gospel destitute part of our earth. We know the Apostle Paul took the gospel from Jerusalem into Europe. Europe took the gospel to us here in America. We took the gospel into Asia, and now Asia is taking the gospel into the 1040. Trained Filipino men and women are often able to get into these countries with greater ease and freedom than we can as Americans. Upon arriving, our goals on the mission field will be to preach the gospel, lead souls to Christ, start New Testament Baptist churches, and train Filipinos to be sent out into local and foreign missions. Our Lord said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Will you partner with us in the labor for souls in Metro Manila? Will you pray for us? Will you help send us forth as laborers into his harvest? Eaton, and uh, I asked the pastor there, how many, he said there were five independent Baptist churches in, in that town, 
And I said, how many are good? He said, this one. But uh, 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 yeah, that's, that's usually what a pastor's uh, reaction is. But uh, I'm glad that West Island State has a good church. Amen. Here in Calvary, that people can receive the gospel of the Lord. I pray that God will use your BBS in a mighty way. But So every village, okay? It's not just the Manilas or the, the New York cities. Every town, every village, Jesus preached in. Uh, look there, it says, the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, uh, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And when... He had called unto him his twelve disciples. He gave them power. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and, and goodness toward us. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, Lord, on a Sunday night. Uh, despite, uh, uh, Lord, all the problems that we see on the news and, and all the uh, fear that circles around, Lord, we still believe that, uh, as Pastor mentioned, the best thing we can do for our country, Lord, the best thing we can do for our, our own souls, Lord, is to be in the house of God. Lord, upon a Sunday. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. We pray that you would uh, encourage us, Lord, on the simple thought, Lord, that the mission is not canceled. Lord, we ask you these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, it uh, is true, I believe, we can say this tonight, that the mission of God is not canceled. Amen. Now, it seems like every, almost everything else has been canceled in the last uh, few months here. But God's mission has not been canceled. We know that because that great commission tells us, uh, Jesus would say, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then at the end, he says, and lo, I am with you all the way, even until the end of the world. That means until now and the rapture, hey, the mission is still on. And we read here in verse 35 that Jesus went about all the cities and villages preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And no doubt, Jesus was moved. He was moved uh, literally in the preaching of, of the gospel of, of uh, the Lord. Now, Albert Einstein has that quote, right? He's famous for his you know, theory of relativity. E equals mc squared. And I remember E means energy. Uh, I forgot what the rest means. Okay? But if it's up to me, it's mc means mission conference. All right? But uh, uh, anyway, he said this, nothing happens until something Moves. Nothing happens until something moves. And, and no doubt the Lord was, was moving uh, here all throughout Galilee. But people ask the question today, what does it take for God to move? When will we see God move? Or, or what moves God? What moves the Lord? But the answer to that is in our text. It's not changed. Lays us back there at verse 36. When he saw the multitudes, the Bible says, he was moved with compassion on them. Fred, we got to understand that what moves the heart of God has not changed. It's still the need, the mission to reach the lost with the gospel. Amen? Now, that's not always what moves us as it ought to. But don't make no mistake, that is what moves the heart of God. And somehow uh, tonight we could, we could open up the heart of God and, and, and peer inside. We would see that God's heart is still to reach the multitudes, to reach those that are lost. There are many needs we have as human beings. Uh, we have physical needs. We have emotional needs. Uh, we have, my wife says I have special needs, okay, but then that's another uh, issue for another time. But the Lord ministers to all of them here. Look at, back, back up to verse uh, 2. Look at chapter 9, verse 2. And uh, look at the background of, of these great verses. Chapter 9, verse 2. We won't read all these for the sake of time, but uh, we're in the great city of Capernaum here. You'll look there at verse 2. It says, and behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on the bed. And we know Jesus heals him, where he can walk. He heals the lame man. Look at verse 20, uh, across the page. Look at verse 20 there. And behold, a woman, which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. And we know she was healed, just, just one touch. Look at verse 25, greater than those. Look at verse 25, it says, And when the people were put forth, he went in and, and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. There was a young girl who had died, and Jesus raises the dead, even in power. Look over there at verse 29. It says, Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes 
were open. He gives the blind sight. Look at verse 33. It says, And when the devil was cast out, the dove spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying it was never so seen in Israel. All these great miracles take place, yes, but, but I submit to you tonight that greater than the seeing of the blind, greater than the casting out of demons, and even greater than the, the, the rising from the dead, there is a greater need of humanity that moves the Lord in our text, and that is when he saw the multitudes that were without a Savior. That is man's, still man's greatest need. Am I right? It's for a Savior. If our greatest need was for technology, God would have just sent, merely sent an inventor. If man's greatest need was for money, God would have merely sent an economist or a divine stimulus package. Amen? But uh, if man's greatest need was for uh, education, he would have merely sent an instructor. But man's greatest need was for salvation. And so thank God he sent us a Savior. He sent us a Savior. He sent us our greatest need. And it has always been God's heart. To reach the loss with this mission. For the first sin of man. You could go all the way back to the beginning. And immediately find God moving. On behalf of the sinner. As Adam had sinned. The Bible says the voice of God. Went walking through the cool of the garden. Saying Adam where art thou. He was seeking out the sinner. You say what do you mean the voice went walking. Well the Bible says the word was with God. And the word was God. That word that voice was Christ. In the cool of the garden, seeking out the sinner Adam. And he's been seeking the sinner ever since, all through the pages of the Bible, until when the fullness of time was come. Thank God that he sent down his son to step into this world to be our Savior, all because that God was moved for my soul and for yours. Amen? Amen. And we ought, to, we ought to celebrate that. And we ought, to, we ought to thank God every once in a while that he was moved enough to step down into this world for the souls of man. Now, I've never been to Capernaum, okay? I've never been to Israel. I've never been there to Samaria, but there was a day when I was blind, spiritually speaking. There was a day I was lame, spiritually speaking. There was a day I had a sinful blood. There was a day, in fact, I was dead in trespasses and sins, but I'm glad that one day I received the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thank God he was moved. Uh, but that's not the thought tonight. That's not the message tonight. The, the question is this. Are we moved? Are we moved? Uh, oh, it's God's intention that we be moved. Uh, we used to take up song requests, you know, from the hymnal and, and our church, and, and uh, folks would give requests of what to sing from time to time. I think if, oh, if it was the average song request in Baptist churches today, it might be that song, I Shall Not Be Moved. Amen? Boy, it's just hard to get folks to, to be moved nowadays. Uh, I like the old song, Standing on the Promises. Amen? Uh, but if it were today, maybe we, folks want to say sitting on the premises. Uh, we, we, we get way too comfortable in our Christianity, but God wants us to have hearts that are moved for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to do that here in our text for the disciples. Because they got comfortable following Christ, boy, watching him preach, watching him minister to people, but now he is going to move them forward. And he does that by first giving them a vision. Uh, if you don't have a vision, you will not have a mission, will you? You, you got to see people as the Lord saw them. And what did he see? He saw them as souls. Look at verse 36 again. He saw the multitudes, yes. He's moved with compassion on them, yes. But why? It says, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. This is how Christ sees souls. Is this how we see people? Now, when I show our video, some remark on the poverty. Some people see the poverty. Some people see the congestion, and, and those things are true. But the primary thing that I see, and, and that we ought to see wherever we see people, are souls. You know, we, we can't see people on the basis of economics. Some see people on the basis of nationalities, or politics, or skin color, or world religions, or Samaritans, or sinners. But everywhere the, work, the Lord looked, he saw people as souls. And we're not going to make an impact on our nation and the world until we see people as souls. Once again, that is the, the, the driving power that moves the heart of God because he saw them as souls, not just souls, but souls that were fainted. It means that they were uh, uh, hurting, weary, worn out. Uh, uh, they had become faint and they were away from Messiah and were about to give up hope. And Jesus saw them that way. But worse than that, he saw them as, as sheep without a shepherd. That means they're lost. Hey, did, we, did we forget? People without Christ are lost, aren't they? 
They don't know what to follow. They'll turn on the news and they'll believe whatever uh, is given to them. Especially young people, they're easily manipulated. We've seen that happen uh, here in our nation. And, and uh, we got to de decide that, listen, we're, we're, we, we want to be on the winning side. And, and we must reach souls and introduce them to the saving, uh, as Peter called them, the saving bishop of their souls that will lead them uh, through the gates eternal. Listen, they are lost without Christ, not only in this life, but throughout eternity. You know, we know the condition of man. We, some of us have known this since Sunday school. But what's missing in our hearts sometimes is the compelling urgency of the mission. It can't be on the back burner of the Christian's mind. It cannot be a side item. Missions or, 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 or reaching souls cannot be uh, a side item of our hearts as Christians. Why is there an urgency on the heart of God? Why did he cry out, the harvest is plenty, the labor is a few? Well, look, fast forward, keep your spot there, of course, but look real quickly at chapter 11, verse 20. Look at chapter 11, verse 20. Why is it urgent? What is the future that awaits? Chapter 11, verse 20, this is Jesus. Uh, it says, Then began he, Jesus, to upgrade the cities, where most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. He singles out some cities. Now look at verse 23. And thou, Capernaum. This is the city where all these miracles take place. This is where Jesus spoke that the harvest there was plenteous. But he says, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. Why is it urgent? Because there still is a place that the Bible calls hell. Amen? Uh, I have to ask, do we still believe that there is a literal place that the Bible calls hell? Is there a place where those... <laughs> people that do not receive the gospel, those people that don't hear, whether here or, or in the Philippines or anywhere in the world, that those people that, that do not receive it, that they will spend an eternity cut off from God's favorable presence in a place called hell. Is there a hell? Because if there is, it seems to me like we ought to have a great urgency in our heart to tell somebody about the Lord. Amen? That's what drives Christ here because he sees the future that awaits those that do not receive him. And so there's an urgency and he cries out that the harvest is plenteous. And the population of the world at that time they estimate to have been around 200 million people alive on the planet when Jesus cried out the harvest was plenteous. Hey, today we live in a world of 7 billion people. If there ever was a day where the harvest is plenteous it's today. Amen? It's not time to slack up, to go comfort. Listen, I, I pray the Lord's coming back. But like the angel said, hey, what, what we ought not to be standing and gazing up into heaven. We have a, a, a mission to do, and the mission is, is, is still valid, and we're going to continue in it until the trump sounds. And so he gives us some essentials, okay, if you will, of a mission. Look back at chapter 9 real quickly at the last thing he said there in chapter 9. Uh, right after telling us the harvest is plenteous, he gives us the first command, the first imperative we see in verse 38. He says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I understood. Uh, I understand you had a great message this morning on praying for our nation. Well, we need to do that. Amen. Uh, well, I believe we, this nation is running on fumes of the prayers of two or three generations ago. Uh, those that pray, God bless America when I'm gone. I believe we're running on the fumes of, of the prayers of great saints of the past and we got to start praying for our nation uh, once again. We know that. St. Chronicles, that is the recipe that God gives us. But here he gives us the Lord's Prayer request. You realize that? This is the only thing that Jesus, God in the flesh, ever asked his disciples to pray for, for him, God's prayer request is this, that laborers would be sent forth. You know why? Because the only way people are going to get saved, the only way people are going to hear, is if there are laborers. You know what America needs in this day and hour? We need more Christian laborers. Amen? We need people to do the labor of praying and to do the labor of soul winning. What a great imperative. Now, when we think of missions, boy, we all know that phrase, go ye. Amen? That's a great phrase. And uh, some of us love that phrase, give ye. Amen? But Jesus begins it with this phrase, pray ye. Because it's essential. We have to get back to praying. His specific prayer request 
that God would send forth rainbows. So I simply encourage you uh, tonight. Why don't we take that up? We'll take it up. We pray for our own requests, don't we? We pray for each other's requests. Let's pray for Christ's request every day. Put it on your prayer list. Say, God, somewhere, somehow, send forth laborers into your harvest field. Wherever you see fit, God, send them forth. Call young men and women. Call some people to, to, to step forward for God into your harvest field as you are the Lord of the harvest. That's where it begins. We're told to pray for the labor and laborers, and I challenge you to do that. Jesus himself prayed that way in Luke's account. You don't need to turn there, but it says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray. And when it was day, he then called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. The Lord prayed about the sending forth of laborers. He prayed for the mission. If you ask, will it work? If I do that, if I do that right where I am, in my home, and I pray, I begin praying, God send laborers. Send laborers to our church, send laborers to uh, this town, send laborers to the world. Will God honor that? I promise you, He will. Amen? Oh, I believe every time you do that, He tugs at somebody's heart somewhere. Because look what happens now in chapter 10. The, the request is answered. It's answered. It says he called, he then called his 12 disciples and he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. It names the 12. Now look at verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into any way of the Gentiles, any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So number one was to pray. We saw that. But number two now, in verse 7 there, he said to preach. He said to preach. This is Christ, the essentials, if you will, of the mission. Other things can come and go. Uh, uh, we can do without air conditioning. Well, not today, amen. It's a hot day. But we can do without that what we cannot do without prayer, amen. And we cannot do without preaching. And by the way, America, listen, Christianity will survive without America. I believe that. I pray nothing happens to America. I pray that we prosper as a nation and God blesses us and the tide turns and we experience a great revival. But if America were to depart from Christianity, I believe God will use other areas. He'll use the Philippines. He'll use South Korea. He'll use wherever there's willing hearts to stand up for Christ and to, 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 to move the mission forward. Uh, the mission will survive without America. But listen, America, the flip side, America cannot survive without Christianity. <laughs> Christianity will survive without America, but America cannot survive without Christianity. What we have, what you have here at Calvary Baptist Church, America cannot survive without it. And so there is a great need to preach the gospel. But isn't it amazing? The same people that Jesus told to pray for laborers is what now they are, those laborers. Isn't that neat how God does that? And that's how it was for many of us. We began praying, God, send somebody, somewhere, and all of a sudden, God shows us where he wants us to be. Amen? And let me help you. If you're, if you're praying, God, send laborers, uh, send someone to witness to my, my neighbors. They're just heathens. He probably wants you to do that. Amen? You're praying, God, send someone to witness to my coworkers. He probably wants you to do that. And that's why he tells the disciples here, before you go to Samaria, before you go to the, 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 the Gentile world, he says, preach it right there where you are. Listen, don't you think, before God gives you a burden for, for across the world, that he's going to give you for burden, a burden for souls across the street. That's where it starts. Sometimes missions, there can be a bit of a hypocrisy with that. We can say, oh, uh, I'm on fire for souls way over there that I don't have to see. All right, what about the ones we see pulling out of their garages? What about the ones we see across the, the, the cul-de-sac? That's what Christ wants us to start this. And that's why he tells them, oh, hey, Matthew, the author of this book, he says, start first in your hometown. This is Capernaum. This is where he's from. This is where he was called. He says, start preaching it right there and then throughout the seas of Israel. And what a great privilege it is to be a witness. By the way, the work of preaching the gospel is not just the job of the pastor or the evangelist or the missionary. We've got to remind ourselves, it's the job of every Christian. Amen. Every Christian has a responsibility to simply be a witness for him. You'd be amazed at what God could do if everybody in this room, the, the faithful Sunday night crowd, if everybody here took it seriously, praying, 
God sent forth angels. God sent forth, and then secondly, he said, God gave me the opportunity every day to look, to, to share with somebody the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'd be amazed. In one year's time, what, what God could do if we availed ourselves for God to work through. Listen, God's power, God's moving, I love the quote, it is like electricity. It can only get in you if it can go out of you. Amen? It can only go in you if it can go. You can only be a possessor of it if you can be a good conductor of it. It's meant to share. He said, by the way, you shall receive power and acts. You shall receive power and you shall be witnesses unto me. It's meant to go out. we got to get it out. And, and thank God uh, for what you're doing through DBS and through World Missions. And we, we got to continue to get it out. It's not about titles or degrees. I have a Bible college degree, but that's not what, what licenses me to tell somebody about Jesus. You could have been saved yesterday, and you could be a more effective soul winner than somebody who has a, a PhD and a doctorate and all, all the accolades there. It's about what, what you have in your heart to tell somebody about Christ. Well, the apostles here were first called to go to the house of Israel. We read that. Later, we know they would be called to go to all the world to preach the gospel throughout all the cities. And that mandate has not been canceled. But the gospel would go to all the world. Not every one of us are called to uproot our lives and move to Africa or Asia, perhaps. So what's the third and final way tonight Okay, that Christ gives us as an essential of the mission? Look there at uh, verse 8. In verse 7, it's to preach. In verse 8, look at the second part of that verse. He says, freely you have received, freely give. Provide, in verse 9, he's telling his apostles, his sent ones, his missionaries, if you will, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet stays, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go as these apostles were now sent out, sent ones is what the word apostles means, as they were sent out to travel all throughout Israel, they were commanded in those verses there not to lay up treasures for themselves on earth, not to even cart along a whole bunch of you all of belongings, but rather uh, they were supposed to freely give the gospel out to all men. But to do that at times, others were called upon in those verses to help come alongside and provide them. To provide the means. So number one, we pray for the mission. We got to do that. That's an essential. Number two, we got to preach the message where we are. But number three, we provide the means for worldwide missions uh, to help the gospel go further than we could go ourselves. Um, you know, if there's a message on, uh, I've noticed if there's a message a preacher preaches on on prayer, boy, there's an amen. If there's a pre message preached on on uh, preaching, boy. Down south states, boy, it's a hallelujah. You know, if it's a message on giving, though, it doesn't matter where it is. If it's a message on providing, boy, it goes down uh, to a holy, a holy grunt. Amen. And uh, pastors have changed the, you know, the sermons. We used to call it giving, then providing. Now, now it's stewardship. Amen. That it sounds better. Amen. Stewardship. But uh, uh, hey, it's still true that it's God's plan that we provide the means for the mission. And thank God you do that here as a church, and you're, you're faithful to that even through this. Uh, pandemic, what a blessing uh, that is. Uh, I remember when I was first called to preach in Oklahoma City and, and 19 years old, we would just go downtown and preach. We thought that's what you're supposed to do on a Saturday night. We'd put our ties on and Bibles and, and go downtown and preach to people and no beautiful churches and pulpits and no lighting and, and certainly no offerings. But I remember the first time I was invited into church to preach, the pastor gave me what was called uh, a love offering afterwards. And, I didn't know what but that was. I almost said, by the grace of God, I'll never stoop so low to take money for the preaching of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I've changed my position on that, amen? Because uh, I'm a missionary now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it's, we find here that it is God's blood. Even from the beginning, here in Matthew 9 and 10, of course, Paul would expound upon that. And I know you've heard all great teaching on that. But he would begin here the teaching. That we as God's people are to provide the means for worldwide missions um, so that the gospel can go further. Now, you can get the gospel to your neighbors and people here by God's grace, 
but and I can take it to Manila, but if I want to have a part in getting the gospel to all parts of the world, just like you have in the back uh, board there, then we and me and my wife, we also give to our churches missions giving. Amen? Because that way I can have a part, I can have a hand, I can be a global Christian, and every Christian ought to be a global Christian, and we do that through the missions program of the church. What a blessing it is to be a part of that. Paul said it this way, not that I desire a gift, he says, but I desire fruit to your account. You realize that? All those on the back wall there, every soul that you read up there that got saved, every church that got started, according to the Bible, it is credited to your account. Amen? Because you have given to help support the work. Because the greatest investment in this life, man, we've seen what stock markets do, don't we? They crash and this world is so fickle, okay? Uh, we're told not to trust in uncertain riches, and, and Christ was right because they go up and down and, and all around, and, and it's all, you can all fall apart at any moment. But the only investment in this life that lasts throughout eternity is the investment in souls. The only thing you can take with you to heaven, sir, man, are souls. Those that you lead to Christ. Boys and girls, you lead to Christ. And those that you help come to Christ through giving to missions. It is credited to your account. What a blessing that is. Paul said, when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. And the truth is, we're saved here uh, tonight, enjoying the blessings of God and of assurance of a home in heaven because somebody, somewhere, gave. Amen? You realize that? Somebody gave. Uh, it could have been a track you received. Somebody gave to get that credit. It could have been you came to church and the lights were on. Amen. You could hear the preacher because the mic uh, uh, was working. Because somebody gave. Somebody prayed. And somebody preached. And somebody provided so that you could be saved. Amen. Our greatest example, though, is the Lord himself. Oh, I'm so glad he prayed. He prayed it through in the garden. I'm so glad he preached. Hey, he preached all, all the way to the cross. He's still preaching and, and as the, as the man beside him is saved, but way more than that, I'm so glad he provided. Amen. Aren't you? That's when it comes to Christ, he didn't just provide a financial amount. Oh, the Bible said it, it was not with silver or gold or corruptible things, but it was a much higher price. The Bible said it was with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without spot and without blemish, he provided what had to be paid for our salvation. Amen. Oh, the Bible said, John simply said it this way, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, uh, Paul would say it this way, that God, remember the grace of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich in heaven, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that we through his poverty might be made rich unto God. Oh, we have all this in heaven too, all because of what Christ paid for us, giving us then that great commission. But I want to end and conclude here on the great positive note from the Lord. Remember what he said there, the harvest. The harvest is plenteous. That's a promise. Okay? Now, sometimes we interpret that to mean that the fields are plenteous. It means there's so much work to be done. That's true. But that's not what all that the Lord said there. He didn't just say the fields are plenteous. He said the harvest is plenteous. The harvest are not just souls out there. You know what a harvest is. The harvest are souls that are out there that are ready to get saved. Amen? That are ready to get saved. And we might be at the tail end of the harvest. We might be at the gleanings of the harvest. But we still got to be laborers. Amen? Uh, I remember my professor in Bible college. He said, boys, he was up in years. He said, boys, it used to be you could go down here to Oklahoma City and, and shake a tree. And he said enough bags would fall out. You could start a church uh, in the 50s or whatever that he was referring to there. I understand it's not that way anymore. But the promise still stands. The harvest is plenteous. There will always be those that, are, that will receive the gospel. According to Christ, the problem is not the harvest. Okay? The problem is the laborers. The laborers. Well, it's easy for laborers to get comfortable and, and blame it on the harvest. But that's not what Christ said. His prayer request still stands. And it's that God will send forth. Jesus said the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. I pray it never be saved in my life or of yours. <laughs> the harvest was plenteous, but the prayers were few. Or that the harvest was plenteous, but the witness, the proclaiming, the preaching was few. Or that the harvest was plenteous, but 
what the provision was for you. No, friend, if the harvest is planted, then our labor for God ought also be planted. Because when we do, God steps in and blesses us. Remember, he said, go, preach, baptize, teach. He said, go, and I will be with you all the way to the very end. You see this word of missions? God is in it. Amen? It's in it right there in the Great Commission. Whether it's here, in this town, in this great work you have here, and, or whether it's in Manila or, or some far distant place, God is in it. We don't wait around for the Lord. He already gave us the command. Go. To go. To go forward in praying. To go forward in preaching. To go forward in providing. When we do, all oh, God blesses it. And He says, I am in that. And I will be with you. Everybody wants to talk about a move of God. But he's already given us that great commission. He promised he would bless. Well, let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and your goodness toward us. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for all those who have been faithful. Lord, through challenging times, Lord, through uh, trials, Lord, through financial uh, uncertainties. But we're called still to be faithful to you. Lord, I know you have a great work, Lord, that you are doing, Lord, in the hearts of men and women all over this world. I believe this virus is perhaps, Lord, the greatest altar call uh, on a global scale, Lord, humbling man. Help us, Lord, to follow up that with the gospel. The only hope, the only hope for man, the only hope for this nation of America, the only hope for the world, the, the mission of, of Christ, Lord, that, that only you can see. Help us to be faithful to pray for laborers, to proclaim the message, Lord, to provide the means. And when we do these things, you step in and bless in a mighty way. Lord, we ask you that you bless our remaining moments together as Pastor comes now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.